thanks everybody for coming. Uh, we are here to talk about deprecations in Node.js and how we're dealing with that in the future. Um, so currently we have a, a, a deprecation system, some rules for that. Um, the typical Node.js deprecation works like this. So you have a feature that is uh, documented, ideally, or maybe not. Um, if it's not documented, you probably skip the first step, because the first step is to mark it as duplicated in the documentation. We typically do that as a sender major change. Sometimes sender minor, we feel that makes more sense, but not usually. Um, then it's marked duplicated in the documentation. Uh, at some point, we may want to transition one step further. We introduce a runtime uh, duplication, so prints a warning on standard error uh, when the feature is used. And uh, well, the final stage, which we may also transition to at some point, is actual full removal of the feature or breakage or whatever uh, applies in that case. And um, do you want to say? Okay. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that's how it currently works. Um, people have very different opinions about what kinds of things we should deprecate and uh, what situations they apply to. Um, we also have, because we didn't quite feel like the, the system was fully, uh, yet was fully sufficient to, to um, and so we introduced an, an intermediate step introduce the dash dash pending deprecation flag to node, uh, which prints runtime warnings for uh, things that are usually only documentation only deprecated. It's like you opt into seeing more deprecation warnings. Um, yeah, so why did I actually want this session? Because um, as Anna already said, is and then um, we are often struggling with actually reaching the persons we want to reach. Um, then they are often not efficient in a way that even if they are printed out to someone, uh, people would not follow up on uh, implementing the change that we recommend. And uh, we cannot afford, or we may not break the ecosystem all the time. So there is like a lot of things that we have to uh, take into account while making deprecations. And um, right now it's more than subpar. We should definitely try to improve the experience on a lot of areas. And this is hopefully what we can uh, figure out in this session. Um, so in, like some people might profit from deprecations more than others. And uh, that's also something that we have to figure out. Uh, and in a way, we want to also get input from every one of you uh, to know um, what your experience with deprecations has been so far. And um, like bad, good, you know, everything together to actually uh, see what we can do. Because right now, I mean, when you, when you use Node, we have no data whatsoever. Um, we don't know how often a feature is used. We don't know how it is used, if it is used. We have some tooling for detecting that, like um, Gizminit and uh, Sigim, which we uh, use to, like Sigim is a tool for anyone who doesn't know it, uh, that runs other node modules um, and test suites against a, a specific Node.js module, and then we check if the test suite still passes with that Node module uh, version. Thank you. And and just minute is um, a tool to um, pretty much run a regular expression over whatever modules you want to choose. We have like uh, separate um, dumps that from the whole ecosystem. Uh, with all node modules out there, and we have them sorted either by the top list pretty much, so all modules that have a specific requirement of um, uh, likes, and they would be preferable, so we explicitly try to not break any of those, and then we can just run it against a, a whole system to see uh, if a specific API is used in the wild or not. But of course, we do not know anything about private code. And we also do not know anything um, 
and like then when you get the output from Jisminit, it's also that you uh, have to first look through every entry if it actually applies or not. Sometimes there is transpile code. Sometimes it's a different API, which is um, just has a similar name uh, as a node core API. And we have to, um, first of all, filter out all false positives. And this is not easy. Like it's it's really really tough situation. Um, sometimes we have deprecations, which uh, make a lot of sense in a way for reason like the API is broken. <laughs> but others we just do it because uh, we have two versions of it with the same name, and well, there should only be one way. Uh, but we still break the ecosystem by doing it. And what should we do? What should we focus on? It's mainly like an input session in this case also. Um, maybe someone of you already has some further input. I, I have some questions about something. I'm not sure if it's yeah. unique. Are we asking about specific this uh, part of the agenda or? Just go ahead and ask. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in Note 12, uh, we recently deprecated Autos for headers on outgoing requests. Um, and uh, I, I use that quite heavily. Um, so I, I discovered it because I ran my test suite and then I saw, oh, there was a deprecation warning. Uh, and I haven't looked into this, maybe, maybe I should know this already. Is there a way I could actually get my test suite to just fail when that deprecation? Yes. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, does the dash dash throw a deprecation command that will, instead of emitting an error, will just run it? Yeah. Great. Great. I, I, I will uh, I will make a, I will probably open an issue or something or, or PR work on getting the features that I'm actually using on the for into a proper public API later. But there, we'll see. <laughs> and yeah. do, do, it's also a dash dash pending deprecation that we don't have been used by a lot. But like if there's something that we're still trying to like see if. It's actually possible to circuit. We'll put it behind the dash dash pending oh. deprecation. So if I run my test suite with that on, and then, and the break thing as well, I will actually be notified before. Yes, maybe yes. my yes. But it's only used like for two or three deprecations, mainly the buffer one. Well, well, no, <laughs> process binding. Process binding. <laughs> oh. uh, so and you can turn it on with environment variables as well. So you can put it in your in your like bash RC, and then every everything you run with you know, nice. including npm. We'll just spew warnings at you, which is really great if you're looking for like first commits to you. There's two other command line options that are useful. One is trace deprecations. So when we uh, when, when the uh, warning is emitted, it shows you where. where. It'll show you where. And, and the other one is I, 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 I doubt that many people are using it at all, but there's also a redirect warnings. It allows you whenever a warning is emitted, we'll output them to a file. Right, so if you're in a CI um, situation and have a lot of output going to your console, you, uh, <coughs> the, the deprecation warning can be buried in that output. This gives you a file that they're all collected in that you know you can uh, look at in several different ways. Tiny correction in case anybody's taking notes, James. I think you misspoke. You said dash dash trace deprecations, it's dash dash trace warnings. <laughs> But I don't think anybody was taking notes, so that was just a just correction. Sorry. <laughs> um, on the kind of making an informed decision um, about what to deprecate and how it's being used, um, are you tracking kind of like from like a analytics perspective of like how many people are accessing the docs in, with respect to those features? Because like there's a lot of features if you put a deprecation <laughs> flag on on the docs, I'm not gonna find that because I don't open the docs for that. Anymore. I so, mean, there's, there's also the all. The docs, like mm -hmm. there's a view of all of yeah, docs, I mean, which yes. is we could theoretically partially yeah. do that. We just removed the tracking of that recently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, we like we had Google Analytics tracking for the docs, and uh, it, it got removed because, because like basically nobody had access to the data. And yeah, that just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's a good idea to like maybe figure yeah. out if like. So like if somebody clicks on the on the link in the doc for for a deprecated feature, like outgoing headers or something. Uh, maybe we could do that. Yeah, I see. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I see uh, there's a 
Does it make sense to add a opt-in flag to get an usage data for those specific groups? I think uh, like that would like it could be possible that we could like do some sort of telemetry that from this. Uh, we could like for example if you use this flag, it will send some requests to a server controlled by us. But uh, like people may opt in to use it in their CI pipelines, like what people would do with coverage reports. They would, you know, after they run the CI test, they would use a module that provided by some coverage service providers and send requests to the servers and collect coverage of that. I want, I'm wondering whether we could do something similar to that and collect the data. Um, uh, like not in production because people would have downside. I like that idea in general because it would actually allow to collaborate pretty much with tools like uh, New York City. Um, and uh, then it could be an opt in flag there. Yeah, like if people yeah. are comfortable with sending coverage data yeah. to coverage services, then they may be also comfortable with sending usage data to our services. But first of all, we probably have to implement something like that in the core. And that's the question, how do we actually do that? Like how would, could we even track an API usages right now? In TICD environments, we, we wouldn't even necessarily need to add in to know to do this. I mean, we already output the, uh, the deprecations uh, warnings. So in those environments, they can just implement a tool to look at the output and extract those things or use like the redirect warnings to get those in the file and then process them. Yes, oh, that right. would be possible for the actual deprecations, but what I would actually also like to have, uh, um, because right now we do deprecations in the blind, honestly speaking. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's like, well, this API could be, it's weird, you know, it's not really doing what we want to have. Um, or we have it duplicated, and then uh, someone might come up with a PR, and then we officially have these three uh, steps of uh, documentation, uh, deprecation, runtime deprecation, and then removal, which is also like, we, we have very, like, when does it happen? Does anyone really do it? Do we later on so say this was a bad idea? Yeah. Um, is, one of the way debug works, we could, we could add these, you know, from basically a point where we can selectively insert them in, the, in parts of the code that we want to watch. They yeah. Have a yeah. Command yeah. Line yeah. Line, they have at least capture some kind of beacon. Want, yes, right? exactly. So, so, yeah. so that's what was one of the points that I wanted to get to, mm -hmm. to actually mm -hmm. have a way of tracking that. So that's why we first of all have to implement something in core. Maybe like you could yeah. like implement some kind of protocol instead of having to parse something. We implement um, the kind of protocol that like these instruction points in core <coughs> can report to somehow. Uh, and like users can choose how they want these reports going out of their environment. For example, if they run the CI test in, for example, a, a environment in their company with firewalls, they may like collect the statistics and then like filter them now and send them to us if they want to. Uh, so why don't we just do a command line argument that just out, you know, and then have the word it out to the file. This thing is on, but these true uh, things mm -hmm. are, uh, are aren't able. Just like the debug, right? Uh, they drop through a local file, and the user can do whatever they want with it. So there's no automatic telemetry being sent up to the server. They have to yeah. explicitly opt in by sending them. Yeah. I mean, we could. Oh, so. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to answer. It's like, as you guys said, it was like, so think about opt-in data is like, very different from from your opt-in. We know what's going on about that. And it's like, so that is, we have to do an opt-in for any of these things, like a you know, pipeline tool that they you know, want to see uses a pipeline mm -hmm. to run that kind of stuff. Yeah, whatever it is, it's opt-in where they're not going to get a lot of information. And the people who don't opt-in are kind of possibly the people that are more similar to the users. Yes, yeah, so, that's why I think that like actually involving NYC and C8 and maybe some testing frameworks is a really good idea because like a lot of people use them, and if they do opt out, like they do that for us, the reporting of the telemetry data, then we don't have to worry as much about that. Right. Um, no, 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 it would be there's opt in, but if those environments that are running the tests, that are running it for you, if they're just always putting that one. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that, that becomes a tough. So I like, I like that idea that if, if in the absence of it being opt out or NYC, 
Yeah, I don't think they are in this room. Yeah. I mean, like Bennett's downstairs. This is right. Can we add it? Oh, yes. What room is this? <laughs> <laughs> Unit one and two. Can we add it to the say the inspector protocol and like the part <coughs> of the coverage so that somehow in the coverage report generated by the inspector protocol there will be you know some metadata about this kind of usage. Just one uh, Just intermediate thing. Does anyone um, um, take notes? Because this is actually like the session is meant to have an input, so we should take notes. It's a bit difficult to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They haven't done it until now, so. All right. Has anyone started or? Yeah. Oh, wait a minute. Um. Yeah. Maybe we should have like a link that we could share to to uh, so people could add different notes there. Mm -hmm. um, can you just send the link to me? James? He's writing code. He's not writing code. Oh, you're writing code. <laughs> OK, so in this case, Benjamin, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Let's just do something. Sure. We also just realized that we do have some data. The thing about the deprecation is to show up on the console. And it's not, it's not perhaps, you know, it's not very strong. So, um, I asked our project about totally putting on the spot. Um, he was in here for this uh, while he was at Telus in the enterprise project feedback thing around phone call metrics type stuff. Um, I'd like to get your opinion because, or like your thoughts on why that's beneficial and how, how that could actually be implemented because things I've heard from you are very opposite from what are the things I've heard here so far. So like be nice to get your on module. On uh, phone and home for node and under like usage of that. So like node processes and node how people are using node to improve that. Okay. Um yeah, the the main theme that I'm coming from is we see a lot of data as the community, we see a lot of data in the open source space that help inform a lot of ideas and decisions. But from my you know guesstimate, that's likely less than 10% or 20% of actual node code that's being written in the world. And most of that is in you know, private enterprise businesses of teams of hundreds of developers building thousands of applications. So how do we surface that? that information from private businesses and companies who are very security focused and very privacy focused, not to indicate their business models or their customer information or anything about what they're doing, but actually feed that information back to the project to give it insights and value. So um, you just came uh, right now. We were already uh, talking about uh, implementing something in uh, tools like uh, NYC. And, and when you run the coverage report, you could uh, pipe it automatically to a file every end deprecation warning. And the deprecation warning itself, currently, uh, in, like what we should do probably in that case, it's like a, often also to have the tracing for, for what code line, but we could remove every uh, information that is actually really about uh, uh, the application you're running. Um, and I mean, do we need to trace in this case? Probably not. Yeah, I would, but, yeah like, we need it because unique, we want to have a unique thing, probably. So. I don't know if that makes sense, but from like purely from a performance perspective, I think the simplest and maybe best thing to do would just to increase counters for every duplication warning we've got. Like for every single one, a different yeah. one, but that just doesn't really provide any like, data that actually tells you about what they're doing. So I think uh, coming from the perspective of you know having been a leader in the enterprise team, and there is any level of data that you know the tech leads, the developer managers, the architecture team, whatever, can get from these type of tools without having to be scrubbed will be useful. And then any then maybe a second tier of that data or a second level of that data that can be scrubbed to give back to the community and give them that option of doing that becomes even more helpful for the collective. 
but you can give them the data, right? Give them the opportunity to understand what's happening in their ecosystem of again thousands of applications. Because we did we did that, we did a lot of that at Telus. We actually scraped a lot of data off GitHub, we scraped all the data off NPM, we did a lot of internal like charts and automation and like all sort of information for us to understand what's going on in our ecosystem because I had hundreds of developers and thousands of applications. There's no way for me to keep track of it. So I needed the data to do that. Direct question from me to you. Um, what do you think about our deprecations in general? Do you think they're useful? Do you think they make sense? And did you struggle with them? Are they stupid? Are they good? You know, where? <laughs> well, deprecation is a general topic um, versus deprecations of APIs in general. Or? Like, what deprecations uh, did you run into? Um, what was, uh, do you, what experience in general did you have with them? Um, well, let me put it this way. The biggest struggle was, well, one of the biggest struggles in, in, a, in a team of hundreds and, and again, thousands of applications is, first of all, knowing which apps are still using what version of Node, never mind what internal APIs are using, and then actually trying to even get off that version. Um, that in itself is a big struggle. So just jumping over that hurdle, then getting to the point of like, oh, are we using the right APIs? Are we using the most performant ones? Are we using the uh, you know most recent versions of them? That's the second tier problem. First tier problem is even getting the structure from a business and funding and capability perspective of just <laughs> getting over all the versions of things. That was a struggle. So if people were able to do that, the next tier becomes the deprecation challenge of, is it worth our time? Right, having done a lot of upfront work of you know, deprecating notes 0.6, 0.10, or whatever was running, then that delta of effort can actually translate to you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for a business. And you have to make that conscious choice. Well, you know what? Just use the old, you know, less performant API because the delta of value is too too slow or too small for the effort involved. And was it uh, like for do, can you tell of a specific API that was really bad, or do you think also some were positive? Like, and another question: Like, when do you consider an API broken? Okay, so this is, I, the, the most relevant examples I can remember. Um, it wasn't related to deprecation per se, but. Uh, just being able to scan our, our systems and finding bottlenecks of asynchronous calls, versus, uh, sorry, synchronous calls versus asynchronous calls, so causing some, causing some, block, uh, some um, performance issues in general. Um, that just took a lot of effort of just getting over. Um, I can't recall anything specific to that application other than buffer. That was the one that comes to mind. But that wasn't bad. That was mostly actually in modules. It was dependencies. So we just updated, bumped the version. And then that became a different tier of a problem, like bumping it, dependency tree versioning and being up to date. So mm. it was a consequence, not a direct reason. Right. We didn't mount that one anyway. Yeah. Because exactly. Yeah. Because updating dependencies is a nightmare. So. Um, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just curious um, of like when we're gathering that data. Does it make sense to only focus on like things that were already decided to be deprecated, or actually like get a better overview of like what are all like what's the usage of all the different APIs inside Node? Because like if you're already starting to gather that data, that way if you realize that something that you might be eyeing at to deprecate actually has a you know, like way bigger usage than than you expected. Um, it might be worth rather putting the effort in, like, to figure out how to how to solve that in a different way than deprecation, rather than like first marking it as deprecation, deprecated, and then realizing that like, oh, whoops, like that's actually a massively used feature. Right. Yeah. And like, I, said, I think especially in the term of like, so I think Ruben's last question here uh, about when an API is broken, that was kind of like hinting at the fact that I think an API is broken when we wrap time deprecated. Like at the point where we do that, where we actually change the runtime to produce deprecation warning, it's already broken. You can't use this in, in CLI applications. And it's just, uh, it's unexpected output from your program. It's not what you want. Uh, and so like, I think looking at the numbers at that point is definitely far too late. And I think like 
gathering that data about what features are used and what frequency we might be looking in general. It could also like help us find things where we can do performance improvements, for example, because it's used a lot, not the other way around. So it's just not just in the context of collecting um, usage information. Um, and I don't know if you can answer this, but you know, what's actually running in your path of production versus what's just used in the code base. Um, like if you could, I did, because I did that, I scanned our code bases and tried to get some information out of it. Um, and it led to false positives where I'm like, oh, you know, FS write file is used X number of times, but it's actually never called in the production. Yeah, but I guess like tracking that we would want to implement is actually to have the calls uh, like to, to count the, the yeah, number of things. Yeah, but we're using NYC, like, is that, is it, you mentioned NYC? Right, yeah, yeah, so this is mainly about, than production. this is not about the numbers, definitely, because you could hit something very different uh, in the test uh, opposed to your real application. That's something, if anyone, like, it's a very hard question, you know, like, how do we solve this? It's a question to everyone in the room. <laughs> So if you have a step to black data, wouldn't that mean that uh, you would delay the application even further because you add one more cycle to your recycle to collect the data and only like even if you did that, you would only catch the people who um, adopt early and people who hold out and are still on the for example. I mean I think they that, won't be represented well. I mean that that's a like you have if you want to start collecting data, you have to start at some point. Otherwise, you will never get there. And like that, 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 that approach is perpetually true until you implement it. And then five years down the line, then you can like always have that data source. Sure. So, so what I'm saying is that if you want to collect uh, data, you have to collect it for all APIs from the start, and not only the ones you plan to use. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Well. Um, uh, I believe we have a lot of APIs which we could track. For example, like we have a lot of APIs that are officially private, but effectively all public. That means every underscore entity in node four. And that's a lot. <laughs> do, do you consider them to be APIs? Yeah, like and people monkey patch them like crazy. And <laughs> if we. <laughs> what, what about like example? <laughs> no, that's officially it's not supported. Effectively, if we break it, we break like the ecosystem. Yeah, but what about like um, you know JavaScript built-ins that you can multi patch? If you multi patch every that sort to be no. <laughs> It's not really the monkey patching that, that, that's the real problem. It's, it's just the usage of it. Like all, like all the streams under bar read, uh, readable state dot finish and things like that. Um, but, but the ability that you can monkey patch something, that's an API, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean yeah. you know, but, yeah. Yeah, when we eliminate the ability to monkey patch, we usually consider that some Right, yeah. I'm sure this was already discussed, but uh, have you considered just looking at the public open source uh, code and doing a static analysis of that and seeing seeing what that uh, contains, the uh, wise? That's that's just a good chance. Yeah. How do you pronounce it? It's um, it's something that Charmer has done a lot of of research into, and the limit is that. Best we can do at that level. But, but, but I guess my question is is it worth it looking into uh, doing the telemetry stuff? Like, or is the other thing good enough? We need more data. <laughs> <laughs> so, one point I want to add on this discussion is right. So, what I would have mentioned, I would think the conversation where the known upgrade is taken by different teams. Say, for example, when they move from six to eight, they do a lot of analysis work on the breakthrough in the whole time. And this is sent right across to the team. Okay, say, for example, we have around 300 microservices running all in mode. All right? None of the team can upgrade themselves. <coughs> the main team needs to upgrade, and they do the work. So taking that ideology into mode can work. So say, for example, in Java, let's say you use an API, you get a deprecation warning. 
But the moment you update the Java for the next version, since Java is compiled time, it crashes immediately, right? Say for example, can't we get all the data, like the remote APIs on a particular version, when the node starts or when the node is getting installed, and with the installation, see, in this particular version, we saw it's going to break because it's like front time breaking. Yeah, that's that what I was saying earlier. How do you scan a code and actually know what's in the path of execution versus testing and that's just correct. in the code but not from the But if that data is available, maybe yes. the main team could reach to the developers of each microservices and then it's the, obviously, I mean, the developers need to take care of, okay, let them you know, do the scanning of the code base and say that, okay, I have to move um, I think part of the thing I'm concerned is that we're worrying so much about the usage data and we don't have a clear enough process for actually killing something in Node um, because we're worried about you know, breaking the ecosystem. But that creates basically this unpredictable problem. So nobody removes the code that's deprecated because you don't need to remove the code that's deprecated, it's just going to be deprecated forever. Um, Why not? So it just feeds itself, right? Um, and <coughs> so I think. Part of it is kind of exposing the data so the end consumer understands like there's the things that are monkey patch, there's the things that are kind of going to break and have a better visibility to it. Also gives us some insight into it, obviously, but I don't think we should be making our decision necessarily based on that data. We should, we should use that data as a tool. To like, we need to have a process. We need to stick to that even if it's going to break from a system perspective. Otherwise, like, it's just going to get worse as we grow. So are you suggesting that like basically all deprecation should follow the cycle of from deprecation deprecation to removal to the end? I'm saying we should we should have all deprecations that get some form now. Okay, I'm definitely not agreeing <laughs> that I, I don't see what's wrong with like keeping things deprecated. Well, why why you just keep them? Like, right. Yeah. yeah. You can create because like when you do that, kind of like it creates this unpredictability. It's just it's hard for the consumer to understand like which of these deprecations are going to be serious and which ones are just like, oh, this is like a thing we don't like using. If you're if you have a clear process and, and everybody knows in two versions that thing is going to be killed, that gives you incentive to keep your code updated. And that gives you incentive to understand, like, okay, I have to do this because I'm not going to be able to keep up with the node versions if I don't do this now. If you and, and this creates also death because like teams just don't do it and then they have six versions of releases. It's like, oh, there's there one benefit of, of at least fighting the label, the deprecation label, and even if you're not going to remove it, which is you send a clear signal that we will not fix bugs here, we will not add your feature request, we will not do anything, and if you use it, you're totally out. Of and so it, to me, that's people like started raising their hands. So yeah, I started a list of things. Yeah, so, so please just John, raise your hand and then. Uh, Yum, you were next. Right. Um, I think what you said is, is very valid, but I think it's missing part of the story. And that is, there's, when it comes to the application process, there's, there's two sides that have responsibilities in that process. So, for example, with the underscore headers thing that was mentioned earlier, if we really want to have a strong application process, which, which we need to deprecate it, so next major version, it's removed. 100%. We cannot deprecate anything that we don't have any replacement API. Because if there is no clear path that you can actually work, you know, use in every single security supported LDS version that replaces it, like in Node 8 right now, there would have to be an alternative API for answer headers. Otherwise, we would not be able to deprecate it. If we would get to that point where we really have Every single thing that gets deprecated has a replacement API all the way back to every supported LTS. I think we could get to a, we can actually remove it. But I definitely know that for me at least, part of the buffer the deprecation mess uh, was that it was not necessarily possible to use the buffer from in all the versions immediately. So I couldn't fix my code and it was just broken. And it, Good morning. So that's just, I think before we can talk about the 
very clear cut deprecation process, we have to start on the node side and then we can put pressure on the ecosystem to actually follow through. I mean, that's part of the process. Yeah, I guess it's like when I say, cool, and I totally, and I totally, yeah, I just wanted to, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. got your mind. Um, yeah, so, no, hey, hang on, hang on, I'm messing with the gentleman on the list, right? So, hey, you're. Um, so that's my question. Okay. Uh, Anatoly, in this case, um, I think uh, we also have here somewhere uh, that um, there might be the point are deprecations useful at all? Because should we sometimes just say, okay, let's break the API? Is that what we want to do instead for some APIs? Um, because if people don't follow up on deprecations, if it's just noise, so to speak, on the, on the terminal and just annoy the people, can we help? <coughs> Is it really like this? Is just a question. I don't say this is right or wrong, you know, but it's something I want to get some feedback uh, on as well. Because having a strict policy about that makes it difficult depending on what API we use. Because sometimes it's a rarely used API, and if we deprecate that, it's probably, it probably doesn't hurt the ecosystem so bad. But then we have other APIs that are used so often and um, that removing it would break it always. Why would it always break? Because a lot of modules are not maintained and they are all used in production, which is a big problem and probably something we should discuss at some point. How can we overcome that problem? It's, it's not only about updating the node version itself. It's also how can we make sure to have up-to-date Node.js modules that don't use these old APIs? Um, yeah, you're good. If I'm, am I have been correct? Uh, yeah, just I'm, skip your part. All right, Jeremiah. Um, yeah, yeah, so on the notion that if you back support, if, if there's like supported APIs that are supported back long enough that you can deprecate and then remove, um, the old API and, and, turn, and, and uh, then use the new API. Like, I would just like to remind everyone that sys still exists. <laughs> Have we forgotten about that? <laughs> it still can, exists. Can, can you repeat it? still exists. What, what does still exist? Sys. 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 That's why I asked. Oh, yeah. This, uh, so, oh, yeah. It does exist. Is it still used? I have no clue. Yes, there are modules that still <laughs> use it. Okay, all right. OK. Uh, Thomas. Uh, two things. Uh, first, you asked the question: uh, Is deprecation warnings even useful? Or why could we break the API? So, on those prohibitors, I found that because of deprecation warning. Uh, so, and now it's on my radar, and I actually opened an issue in our repo uh, that we need to make sure that we kind of figure out what to do about that. We haven't done it yet, but that's the only reason why that is on on the radar. We technically also have a test that tests note, note nightly, so if it was removed, we would probably have discovered that those tests failed. But it's nice with the deprecation. That was the first thing. The second thing is all the modules that already exist out there, which also said. And one thing that, that actually would be really, really cool, I think, that I would love to use is something similar to Beekeeper, where yeah. it would open issues saying, Oh, you're using this API uh, in your code that is going to be deprecated soon, or we're considering deprecating, or something, uh, depending on the level that you configure it for. That would be really, really awesome. If if we would consider building that as part of the project, I will work on that. So that's, that's awesome. I like it. Okay. <laughs> I, I, will, I will do that. Somebody put that in the minutes. Because you're <laughs> like, oh, God, uh, so. Assuming that we want to throw away there's a valid assumption that um, every deprecation would provide a, a quick fix, then wouldn't it be in theory possible to write a compiler to do that for every code? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we could probably just use a code in Babel. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like you can mm -hmm. use their existing ecosystem. Yeah, I think I've actually. So on on the on your point with like um you found the underscore headers because of the deprecation one and now you're updating it. The problem is that like initially when I encountered my first like deprecation warning as a user, uh, I was like, all right, I should like I should fix that 
because it's going to be removed at one point. But like by us actually not removing stuff, you know, like it, like as a user, you just get trained to like, all right, like what if I just like mute those, you know, because it's like it, it's not going to do anything, right? Like they're like the stuff is going to be around, which means that like why would you have the motivation to remove stuff? Because like in other projects, you know, if I see something is deprecated, I know I need to get uh, get my stuff together to actually fix that because it will disappear at one point. And then I can't blame anyone because like I've been warned. But if like Node keeps on setting the precedence of like, oh, like we marked something as deprecated, but we keep it because we can't break the ecosystem. Like, okay, okay two, two, two quick rule changes. One is I'm gonna start uh, timing, not that anybody's going over, but we are running out of time. And two, I'm going to leap ahead to people who have not yet had a chance to talk. So go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm Manuel from the package maintenance team. I would like only to, to say that uh, our uh, task is uh, to um, maintain those modules that are uh, wide uh, with a high usage, but not maintained, for example. So uh, in our agenda, there is also a tool uh, for transpiling, or for example, uh, we build a demo that uh, co converts a uh, new buffer to buffer from and uh, open a PR, for example. So uh, we are very uh, about it. Good, Emma. Uh, yeah, I, so regarding the greenkeeper stuff, too, I know Nikita has done a lot of manual outreach work in, like, for the buffer uh, conserved deprecation. And, um, like if, if it goes like that, I would leave that to a tool because get, it can get kind of faster, yeah. frustrating. You have to interact a lot with the maintainers themselves. Yeah, maybe we'll do that. It, it'd be good for an opt-in solution. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and and regarding like like trans transpilation approaches, I mean, like for those cases, I would prefer to just not deprecate and set or only documentation deprecate and then keep the alias or whatever tag. Because if you can transpile, you can also provide like an alias or a wrapper or something or like that, and not have anybody break code at all. I mean, that's ideal for me. Okay, Ruben, 90 seconds, go ahead. <laughs> um, direct follow up on that one. So I personally think uh, documentation deprecations are normally completely useless, honestly speaking, <laughs> because um, we already, like uh, last week uh, on a conference of dinner, uh, the main problem with Node.js is docs. People don't look at them. And um, you know, if we uh, document that it's deprecated, no one will change anything. They would even implement sometimes the documented part. And so if we did not um, uh, document an API before and now have it in the docs where we say, hey, this API is deprecated, then my, some people might actually use it instead of not having used it before because they looked at the docs. So it's like the opposite of what we actually want to achieve. Um, and uh, thus, I, I really I, I think we should not uh, um, have uh, documentation deprecations in 90% of the cases. Most of the time, they are not useful. They do something else than we really think they could, they, they would. Okay. Uh, uh, you've not talked yet, have you, Alejandro? Oh, yes, uh, sir. Um, you've not. Go ahead. So, on, on the, we actually have the numbers for um, the docs. You can check that out. Uh, on another one, on that, we have we. Uh, it changed like uh, um, sort of like uh, displaying that API has been uh, deprecated and like uh, toggle the, the complete page on the top to, to by default and just uh, expanding that on, on the click or something like that just to get the, the Person attention to see first that it's deprecated and that like, you don't want to use it and so on. We're on the okay, we're entering lightning round. We have five <laughs> minutes, so one minute apiece. Thomas, Anatoly, James, and anybody else, raise your hand because I didn't see you. Just, just skip, skip, on. skip, Anatoly, <laughs> skip, James. Uh, yeah, just on the dark, uh, on the dark deprecations. Uh, I think we could easily start working towards making those pending applications in every case, right? So at least we have um, some way of servicing those. Go ahead, Dominic and enjoy. Oh, wait, wait, first. Sorry. What if you, like, after going pending deprecation, what if you, like, actually remove it from the docs? 
like you can still have the code in it, but like remove it from the docs. So I think yeah. this idea was good, which is the item. Yeah. Sure, so you uh, go. Uh, do we have like any kind of, for example, JSON thing like that tooling can consume about the uh, deprecation information? Because like right now, if you want to look at you know what is being deprecated, you probably need to look at that vision, that MD, which is not really something you can consume. You probably have to parse. There, like, there's okay. JSON docs might be in there somehow. Go ahead. But yeah, those are not. The last time I checked, those are not really something that you can use as a tool. <laughs> yeah. It's like it has a lot of weird tags around in the JSON. Right. Uh, Jan and who else? Uh, Jan and Jeremiah and Yang, I guess. So. Uh, actually, building on the JSON question, uh, are we working with the TypeScript team that maintains no type definitions to add definitions there? So that they, for example, if somebody is using the receiving code with this one more people these days, they get those warnings there? I don't believe we are. So the, 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 I think the no TypeScript stuff is just a definitely type. So if anybody can just take a pull request and uh, so, but it's a good, that's a good idea. We should do that. That's good to talk about putting it, putting it into no forms, but I'm not sure what that's next. Go ahead, Jeremiah. Um, is there a problem with just always warning right away when you get there? Unconditionally? Like just, I mean, not unconditionally, like obviously you have the flag and stuff, but um, just when we deprecate things, something, we we add like the warning directly right away. Uh, with that dash dash panic deprecation, with that specifically Jen's suggestion, I don't think. Oh, I mean like the vis visibly, not not pending. So but, I guess this comes uh, to types of deprecations. Yeah, we have different types, and that's the problem, because sometimes we have human facing ones. Uh, which um, are consumed, for example, in the REPL. Yeah? You're using the REPL, you're the actual end user, and um, there is something, why ever, I don't know what, in the REPL deprecated, and now you get the notification right away. That's the user that should receive that notification. Awesome. But then we have the buffer one. Uh, and you know, it's like, and with the buffer, who's actually the person who reaches? It could depend, like, it could reach anyone. And it could be like a deep down dependency where you don't uh, and have any influence on uh, the maintainer. You cannot change it. Uh, and for whatever reason, you're also bound to using that module still. Company bots. Okay. Um, then we have uh, APIs that are used by modules, used by applications, different frequencies of usages. So all these implications, I think we should start thinking not in a generic term for deprecations, but more about for what APIs are we actually recommending to always go to a, um, a runtime deprecation, which would be your thing, but other APIs are actually pretty bad as such. So we have to determine while deprecating things, what type is it and by whom is it used? And after detecting that, we are then able to identify what to do with that right away. That would be my recommendation. So James is very eager to say something. I think Yang had something, no, and Joey I think had something yeah. to say. And I have an important lunch announcement. So we're going to go, James, Joey, important yeah. lunch announcement. And I'll make it really quick. So just the, the buffer, the whole buffer constructor issue is going to be a huge because we were automatically uh, just warned by default and we ended up breaking up a large number of people. And this type of uh, deprecation is going to be extremely painful for maintainers. Macintosh. Just because one maintainer alone has something like over 800 modules, most of which use buffers in some way, right? It took us um, months to kind of go through and update some of those modules, and we still haven't got through them all just to update the buffers you can use. So we have to be very careful about the burden we're putting on, main, on, on module maintainers. Yeah, I mean, the thing with buffer is that, like, it's pot, it's pot, it was a foot gun, but it's totally possible to use it in a safe way, and he was in most cases, but probably all cases. But, uh, Joey, did you? Did you have something? No, okay. Important lunch announcement is as follows. Uh, lunch will be in the restaurant area downstairs. So not where we had the breakfast, but where if you are staying in the hotel, you go in and you sign your room number and you have breakfast there. That's where lunch will be. So, so if you come out here and make a left, go down the stairs. Can we just follow you? 
<laughs> sure, <laughs> yes. And uh, time's up, I, but this this sounds really, really ripe for some hallway track um, <laughs> discussions, because I have like a million things I want to say. Uh, yeah, I hope you all uh, found that also valuable, and Sorry. I would also love to continue uh, the general discussion. I would also like to get more feedback from companies here. For example, Netflix didn't really say anything. <laughs> and <then there's>, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> IBM didn't say anything. Yeah. Uh, I, I like a lot of companies should just like say yeah. and, and tell us their yeah. Is this not yeah. where we can track? Is. So I would, um, I, I'm, I, if, if uh, I would be willing to do that as a, a strategic initiative. Yeah, I think it's strategic. Yeah. We actually, I think we actually good for them to go there's a sort of that search and then help them. That would be, you know, oh, hi. Yeah. Yes. Like hi. 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 But if you're doing that already, right? If I keep if you're building that into to for example my ATM agent, I mean you might as well just build it into a course because if this is something the user needs to set up for yes, the agent, it, you might as well just set it up for his note process. Yes, the problem is that how do we reach the key? That is mainly the problem. So it would be something on top to uh, uh, the, the feature itself is implemented in core, but and to actually opt into it, it's like yeah, but how do they opt into the if, it's in, if the agent uh, asks them to? They don't think it's better if you do this as part of like NYC news. What? Yeah, the yeah. coverage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think NYC is a better is yeah. a better approach. Uh, I think so. But what do you think about the time base? Like to because I mean I in this case you could have. Sell this I'm, I'm thinking with my yeah in a position <laughs> like you where I'm not able to sell this to somebody mm -hmm. in the company. It's going to be hard to convince. So like someone to turn on, uh, but for a single day, you know, you could have like check it for the one day. Once they, they, slow slow they would just do it forever. They don't yeah. give a shit. Like, it, 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 imagine I'm, I'm like, an, I, I run a team in some enterprise company and I have to deploy this. Like, I get nothing from it other than being nice, and there is a risk that like I will be interrupted in the middle of the night because there is a performance issue. It's, it's, uh, it sounds like a hard sell, but the uh, coverage sounds like very simple. Yeah, is, I, think, I, think, I think NYC is a better. Yeah. I'm wondering if I can like push it to sign on, <laughs> like randomly. Like if you install a spy, it will stop like collecting yeah. data or something. And, and and even like 
think about this, like from a code copy, I'm, I'm, uh, we use code copy. And currently, I mean, we log in and we can see like a nice, with colors and graph, and like a nice graph, like where do we have this coverage and others. It's super nice, super nice tool. That kind of coverage is also about like which API we, we use, I guess. Like, so it would actually be nice for me, just for me as a user to have the same information. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it actually makes sense for, for, for a company like CodeCop to build that in. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, because me as, I, as a user, I would actually like that. So how can we sell the um, actual implementation? That's a problem. So what you, I mean, you have to build the node API, which is basically just logging whatever this is. So I mean, I imagine you could even have basically node debug in C++ type of statements that mm -hmm. literally just all they do is I, just store this. I, I, I think. Like similar to how NPM is constantly uh, tweeting like download numbers and okay, this is the top 10 most downloaded things and, and the, uh, people are using this node version or that node version and stuff that, that is not directly accessible, but, but they, they, they have, have access to, right? So they are aggregating a lot of data uh, that is normally not accessible and then they're, they're tweeting about it. So CodeCop could potentially they're, they're collecting all this data anyway, they could aggregate it and they could send it to, to the Node Foundation, uh, OpenJS Foundation anonymously. It doesn't have to say which project it's using. It just say there is 10% uh, of, 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 of our users running on our system are using exactly. this API. Yes. Uh, and yes. They, I, I'm not even sure they would have to, depending on their privacy policy, but I'm, I'm not even sure they would have to because and, in, uh, right because they already have access to they always they already have that right right and, and, and they could just do it yeah exactly they could probably just want to query on their system mm -hmm. and see all this information mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. i think if we just i'm not sure who code cut is in <laughs> uh, i assume that they're not node.js only people or javascript yeah. only people i think they probably also do ruby and stuff but if we could if you could get in a dialogue with code cut or similar there's other companies yeah. uh, code which is well used within the node ecosystem uh, that would be an interesting discussion, I think. Mm. And then there's no opt-in. It's just in cost labs so and, I, and stuff like that. I wonder mm -hmm. how much of this is actually needed for Node versus like the consumer. So like CodeCup presents CodeCup, which also presents you with information. Yeah, and I think for producers it's also that's more useful for Node than yeah. the part where we get the data. So I actually don't think, like I still don't think that us acting on this data is the thing that's going to make a meaningful difference. I think. Because like we have plenty of data about buffer usage, we still have the number of people switching over. That's correct, but there is a couple of things that would be great. For example, we have so many underscores and APIs. I would yeah. love to. Now we have private stuff. I mean, we could start moving things, you know, to actually um, reduce the burden for us as maintainers to think about these things. And in this case, if you see that API is actually not used in the wild, then you would be able to just change it. That's but, but, what I would love. So somebody said that this was just continuing to be a problem going forward and it's just going to grow. I don't think so because in the future, all new things we're building, we're going to it's make private. sure we, we, we're going to use so symbols or, or private things. Uh, symbols is not good enough for It gets it gets worse from the oh, sorry, I was not said that. Not from the perspective of um, we're adding more things that are going to be deprecated because they're like mm -hmm. hidden. I'm saying there is always going to be deprecations because like you're, there's always going to be things that are going to change. There's going to be things that we decide are bad idea. At some point, I can see us deciding next thing is bad idea because we have a few microsites. Yeah, okay, but, but there's, there's, two, there's two types of APIs, it is. right? There, there's, it's there, a really there's, confusing API. So all, all the all the yeah. stuff that are underscores are supposed to never be used, which yeah. are used. Yeah. There's not going to be more those. No, I agree with that. We're not doing anything. Like, if you look at what uh, Frontend is doing, like what Frontend frameworks are doing, and they have like this problem times 100 because they yeah. drink stuff a lot, a lot more often. And if you look at some of the worst offenders like Angular, they have really decent tooling that will actually like migrate your project from API A to it's API B. Angular is pretty cool. And it's easier for them because for example, if we create like a, like a Babel transform, uh, that, would be awesome. that would be awesome. But if someone is for example using TypeScript, then like uh, which is, yeah. Or, or like like anything else that won't let Babel like parse the syntax, uh, then it, it sort of becomes a problem. I guess Babel can parse TypeScript, but mm -hmm. he, like the next thing that's not like uh, directly uh, par parsable by the tool. And the other thing they have is like compatibility packages, like React DOM, React DOM compat, and then like uh, 
if you, the problem is dependencies. Like if you have, uh, for example, if you want to ever deprecate next tick, you can say, okay, this API is not available anymore. And then you have a million packages that use next tick. You want to make next tick available to those packages, but not to your code. It's still recording, by the way. Oh, uh, right. should, should I switch that off or? Yeah, we can just, yeah, I mean, I think that's actually a great idea of having the packages that basically bring this functionality to people who need it. Well, how, how do I, I'm not even sure. Yeah, the, the, the problem with that is that like, let's say for example, uh, uh, yeah, it's not something you control right. there. So Bluebird yeah, uses process.next tick. And if, if there's a million uh, different packages that they're using Bluebird, uh, they, they're using different versions, like Bluebird 3.5. And uh, even though we've been trying to get them to use it less, they, they're using it more. Like the last year in the summit, we added a big warning that says, hey, don't use Bluebird if you're, you, you can use native promises and a bunch of that. So in response, now the download numbers went up from like 7 million to 12 million. Uh, didn't work at all. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so and a, and a bunch of people are using, let's say, Bluebird 3.4, which is two so, years old, and right. that's, that's just uses next tick, and like yeah. it's controlled we, by we the can't control that. So we need some uh, way okay. to make yeah. that available but to those I'm users not sure how to. without making it available to the other users. Yeah. So, uh, so maybe you make it. Every it wasn't recorded. It's, but it's just it's just here recording. All right. So I'm not sure how to get started. Maybe yeah, this was just a client. Maybe like, somebody else is controlling we, it somewhere. Uh, Maybe. Like, let's I'm say gonna, I'm gonna, I think someone else is actually.